This is the third week we're talking about contradictions in the Gospels. Um, and I want to point something out. Okay, let's assume, for the sake of argument, that all the errors that, that we're finding, okay, the, the genealogies, that they were mis that they're mistakes. They're not done on purpose. They just made these huge mistakes. Can it still be the word of God if the original author made a mistake? That's the thing I want you guys to think about. Can the Bible still be the word of God if the person who wrote it made a mistake? They messed up on the genealogies or they misquoted a verse. Or, you know, w when Mark says, hey, as Isaiah the prophet said, when it was actually Malachi and Isaiah, you know, are, are these are these things that make it not the word of God? Think about this for a second, okay? It, is it important? Does it make it not the word of God? Any ideas so far? It's okay if you don't. I just want you to think about the question. Kind of crazy, right? I'm going to give you my uh, my idea, but I just want to see just make sure that nobody else had any ideas they wanted to share. Nicole, looks like you were you were you were chewing your fingers. That no, you got I something. Oh, okay. So you didn't have anything. Okay. You like no. I feel like um yes and no. Okay. Can you explain? Um. Yes, because mainly at the end it said that you know this is. Uh, at the end of Revelations, you know, like the last couple of verses, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, you know, this is, this is everything I gave you, this is, you know, all God breathed, or whatever, and anybody that takes away from it, you know, or adds to it, and then also, um, no, because if it doesn't have to do with salvation, I don't really feel like it would be relevant if it was stretched. Um, but then again, I feel like it would be because then people are like, well, that was lies, you know? I can't trust the whole Bible. If I know part of it's a lie, then all of it can be a lie. Okay, what if it's not necessarily a lie, just something that there, it was a, a genuine error? Okay, like, let me give you some different degrees of errors. I'm writing down, you know, this genealogy, and instead of spelling Gracie, G-R-A-C-I-E, I spell it G-R-A-C-Y. That's an error. It's the same person, just an error. That's a small mistake. Or let's say I make a bigger mistake like this. I forget about Gracie in total. And I say, you know, Eli, the father of, oop, let's skip Gracie and let's skip her son and let's go over here. Is it? I feel like as a Christian, it doesn't really bother me at all. But I feel like to a non-Christian that you're trying to explain the Bible to, and they're genuinely, genuinely um, curious and wants to know, I feel like some of them could be hung up by the fact that if there is a couple mistakes in the Bible, that there could be a lot more that we just don't know about. Okay, so let's, let's, all, let, let's think about this. Here's another aspect of this. Does it matter... Whether the person did it on purpose or on accident. Let's say there's an error in the Bible or an apparent error, and they put it in there on purpose, or if they did it on accident. I feel like that's a yes and no as well. Mm -hmm. um, no, because they're not intentionally trying to deceive us, but yes, because it goes back to the thing of, you know, if they made an error here, then they're going to make an error in other places. Okay. So then the next question being, is it possible that when Revelation says don't add or take away, that it's talking specifically about the Revelation itself and not about the whole Bible? Um, you know, I always thought it was talking about the whole Bible because it sounded like it was talking about the whole Bible. But it was a... a Revelation was a separate thing, so I mean, like... There is a possibility that it's talking about revelations. I mean, I, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't be against hearing the argument out. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything? This is just something I wanted you guys to think about. It's not something I wanted to, it's not a main point. I believe that it could still be the word of God and have genuine mistakes in it. Because, well, let me, let me say a few things. First off, sometimes people say that every word or word for word is the word of God. This is a hyper-literalism that is actually impossible, and I'll tell you why. Because in translations, there's going to be more and sometimes less words than there are in the originals. 
um, this is this is a huge uh, just a false idea that every word in the Bible is the word of God. It can't possibly be. Sometimes translations will add words, and sometimes they'll take away words to make it coherent in that language. If you look in your Bible, for instance, you'll see sometimes words will have italics on them. It's impossible to be a literal translation. It's, it's literally impossible. That's not how translations work. Sometimes there's an idea that you have to get into the, into the words, and to not get that idea across, even though it's not in words, would be to mistranslate. For then sometimes people think that something's being said that is not being said. See what I mean? So English cannot be word for word. So when you say that the, the word of God is word for word, the word of God, you have to be talking about the original. The original author wrote something that was word for word what God wanted. So does it have to be word for word what God wanted? Or can it have mistakes and, and that kind of stuff and still carry the idea that God wanted? I believe that it can because... There's no point that is discredited by by assuming that there could possibly be errors, although I have never found an error. And there's no truth of the Bible that's invalidated, even if you allow for mistakes. Let me show you what I mean. Let's assume that the genealogies of Jesus are wrong. Does that mean that Jesus is not God? No. It would still require God causing a... Uh, pregnancy in a woman that did not have sex. So there would still be the miracle of Jesus' birth. So I mean, no truth is invalidated. Jesus is still God. He still died for us. Like, it didn't really change anything. So I don't believe that it does, but obviously there are room for, for disagreement. So let's look at some difficulties, contradictions, and misunderstandings. We'll start with Luke 2, 1 through 2. It says, and this is something that a lot of times people will uh, bring up because we do have record of of Quirinius's uh, census, but the problem is is when that census actually happened. Luke chapter two verses one through two says, "Now in those days a decree went went out from Caesar Augustus that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria." So the problem is, is that the record of Quirinius' census that we have happened in 6 AD after Jesus' birth. It's the wrong date. How do you get around this? Well, actually, it's not as complicated as most people make it out to be. First off, Quirinius apparently was a pretty popular name, so it's very possible that there were two different people. It's very possible that he served two times. Maybe he served and then didn't serve and then served again, for instance. It, these, these are all possibilities. Or it could be two separate censuses. Census? <laughs> um, and, and, and so there are different options there. But then there's, there's another little thing that, that needs to be said. Remember I said that a lot of times in a translation you won't know because you don't have full historical knowledge. You just kind of take a guess and sometimes you're wrong. And it, once you have historical knowledge you have to retranslate. That could be what's happening here. A, a point could be made that the translation should read as this. This was the census. This census was before that made, that made when Crinius was governor. So, in other words, it's the it's prior to that that census. In other words, he's not saying this was Crinius's census. He's saying this is one that happened before that census. The question being, why oh why would and I have it right here. Um, and I already said those two things. Cranius was a popular and it could be two different people. Why or why would Luke bring up an easy-to-verify historical account unless he was sure? Just because we don't have full knowledge of, of the historical account doesn't mean that we should just instantly hop to the conclusion that our limited knowledge disproves Luke's sources. It doesn't. It doesn't. So let's look at some genealogy comparisons here. If you compare... The genealogies in Matthew with the genealogies in um, Genesis and in Luke, you see some very big differences. The first one, now I did not include the genealogy from Chronicles. I did, I did not do that. To be honest, I actually kind of forgot. So, sorry. Um, first off, when you compare the genealogies in Matthew, which is on the right-hand side there, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, um, Halalil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Arphaxad, Canaan, Shelah, Hepher, uh, Peleg, Ru, Sarag, Nahor, Nahor, Terah, Abraham. There are some slight spelling variations from Genesis, which is to be accepted. I, I'm sorry, expected. 
Um, Matthew is in Greek, and um, Genesis is in Hebrew, so there's going to be some differences there. Um, also, it includes uh, Canaan, or Kainan, whatever, as the son of Arphaxad in Luke. So there is a difference there. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I, I'm sorry. That, that list on the right is from Luke, not from Matthew. Matthew doesn't go back to Adam. Matthew go, goes back to Abraham. Sorry, that was my bad. So, psh, rewind. The, the list on the right is from Luke chapter 4, uh, the genealogy of Jesus. Now, when you compare this to, gen to Genesis, there you go. That's what I meant to say. There are some spelling variations, and also uh, in Luke, it includes Canaan as the son of Arphaxad. So, um, in Genesis, it goes Arphaxad, Shelah. In Luke, it goes Arphaxad, Canaan. Shayla, which I already explained last week about how you could drop a person's name and it really wasn't that big of a deal. You, you, they actually did this for a, for a lot of different reasons. Matthew doesn't go this far back, but that's likely because Matthew was written for a different purpose than Luke was. But this is where the real problem comes in. After Abraham, after Abraham, um, you get to these people and the the two genealogies are super different. They have the first couple names. Like, um, I think they both have Abraham. I think that they both have Isaac and Joseph, if I remember correctly. I, I think. And so then, this is how they go. Matthew is on the left, Luke is on the right. Matthew goes, Joseph, Jacob, Ma uh, Methan, Eleazar, Eliot, Achim, Zadok. Now, right is Luke. Joseph, Mephat, Levi, Melchi, Jani, Joseph, Matthias, Amos, Nahum, Hesley. You can see that there's nothing similar with those names. Didn't they follow a different lineage, though? That's a possibility. Um, it is definitely a possibility. Um, there is definitely one of them has has more of a um, slant with Joseph. The other one has more of a slant with Mary. For instance, Matthew tends to follow uh, Joseph. You know, Joseph is the one who's having the dreams. He's the one leaving, leading the family to Egypt and then to Bethlehem and all this different... He's the one doing all these things. I should say Egypt and then Nazareth. Um, Luke, on the other hand, doesn't mention any of what Joseph is doing. He just goes on to Elizabeth and to uh, Mary and all this different stuff. So it is possible. They both do have the emphasis on the different, quote-unquote, parent. Um, there are a few things to mention, though. Matthew follows uh, follows the kings. If, if you keep going down the list, it starts going through, like, David, Solomon, and you see what I mean? It goes through the, through the kings. Um, or maybe not Solomon. Maybe it's the other son that it follows. It, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, moral of the story being that it follows the kings to show Jesus as connected to the law, to show Jesus as connected to Israel, to show Jesus as the the David that they've been looking for, um, you know, the, the, the ruler that they've been hoping for, this kind of stuff which prophecy talked about. So Matthew's connecting him to that. Luke isn't as interested in that, so he's kind of just more following the line. Um, Luke, however, does go all the way back to Adam when Matthew stops at Abraham because Matthew just wants to show Jesus connected to the law, thus Abraham. Luke wants to show uh, Jesus as the ultimate man, probably for, for Greek purposes because Greeks were like in the search of this perfect, you know, ultimate man thing. So anyways... Uh, Matthew also begins with the genealogy. Luke um, adds the genealogy, genealogy all the way in, in chapter 4, and he does this for emphasis, but we're not studying Luke, so let's move past that. Um, it is possible that Matthew is tracing Joseph's line, and it is possible that Luke is tracing Mary's line. That's possible. But the pro one problem with that is that Matthew's line includes women, and Luke's doesn't. Luke is the most pro-woman of the Gospels. He, he includes more accounts of the, the role of women in, in the role of the Gospel. He follows Mary, all this different stuff, highlighting women. Yet he doesn't include a single woman in the genealogy. Matthew, on the other hand, is trying to show the kingship of Jesus, and he includes multiple women. So it's possible that those are two different lines. It's It, it causes a lot of questions as to why is it like that? possible, though. I'm not saying that it's not true. Um, th there is another distinction that is, once again, possible. It's possible that Matthew is a legal genealogy and Luke is a literal genealogy, because Luke would be more concerned with 
actual historical fact, he might be more concerned about getting the actual line, whereas Matthew, not as concerned with, with the line, is more, try, more writing for a specific purpose, showing Jesus as the legal um, ruler. Um, so th those are both possible. I kind of feel like that's one step away from lying, though. It it's possible, you know, they did have different practices at the time and whatnot, but I just, that one doesn't really make as much sense. I tend to lean more towards, like, what you brought up with the whole different parents, different genealogy lines, or different lines, yeah. Then you get to another thing. It is possible, now follow this, think about this, okay, this is getting a little bit complicated. It's possible that Joseph had a father who died, and then his half-brother married the widow, in which case Joseph would have not one but two fathers, which would have two different lines, if the brother was not a full brother but a half-brother. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So it's a possibility, but once again, there's no way to verify that possibility. So it's just kind of more of a stab in the dark. Legally, that could happen. With the law, the way that the law is, that totally could happen. But we just don't know if that's actually what's going on. So um, then that brings up one last question that is worth considering. And, and this is something that I think it's we can't really answer this contradiction because of this question. And this is the question. How do you handle a genealogy with a virgin woman and a child with no earthly father? How do you handle that? Why would you follow the father's line when the father isn't the father? But how could you follow the mother's line? Ah, I don't know how to do this. You have to understand that this is the only time in history that this has ever happened. So we don't know what the protocol and procedure is. <laughs> Well, I feel like that would be kind of like, you know, how when a uh, king doesn't have an heir, uh, they adopt someone into their line so that way they can become um, an heir to the throne. Mm -hmm. I feel like it would be kind of like that. Maybe um, that's how Matthew saw it, and maybe that's how we have that line. Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't actually always thought, I didn't ever think that the lineage that they gave was um, actual literal. I thought it was kind of like a... Um, generation type thing well this happened uh, this is the person from this generation which reached to this generation which reached to this generation and so on um back to the uh original thing because i honestly i didn't i guess i just didn't really think that jesus had to be lined up with anybody specifically in history i didn't think it really mattered well, you know, I kind of agree with you, but evidently it matters to some degree because two of the four Gospels have a genealogy. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, these are great questions, but ultimately we don't have the answer, so... Maybe because it's prophesied? That's why they had to tell us? Because it's prophesied? Your guess is as good as mine, buddy. This is a contradiction that we have a lot of possibilities for, but we really don't know. And then, like you said, are, were they trying to do a historical genealogy or no? I, was like, yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. So, um, since we don't know their purposes, we don't know their, you know, we don't fully understand like they did, there's a lot of things we just, okay. Until we have more clear um, revelation on that, which we might never have more clear revelation. Remember, this is not a pursuit of having all the answers. It's a pursuit, I guess you could say, of the pursuit. <laughs> So, anyways, the next contradiction, John chapter 7, verse 41 through 42, says this. Others were saying, this is the Christ, but others were saying, surely the Christ is not coming from Galilee, is he? Has the scripture not said that Christ comes from the descendant of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So, it's, a lot of people have said, whoa, hold on, he didn't come from Galilee, he, he came from Nazareth, or, or from before that, he came from Bethlehem. Well, this is really a matter of perspective. First off, Nazareth is in Galilee, so he came from Galilee. Bethlehem was in Judea, so you could technically say he was from either. Jesus was from Bethlehem because he was born in Bethlehem, but they moved from Bethlehem to Nazareth, so he was a Nazarite. See what I mean? It's just a matter of perspective. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but moved to Nazareth. Um... Uh, something that's worth mentioning, there's no reason to think that Jesus was exactly 30. I know that, you know, judging from a, a couple places in the, in the Gospels, people come to this conclusion that he had to be exactly 30. Rounded numbers like that oftentimes weren't literal. So it do, we don't have to, like, hold it to, like, some exact, precise 
account. It's possibly he could have been 34 or 37. It, 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 irrelevant. Like, it, it's just a way of... He was 30. Yeah. Nowadays, we would have said something like this. He was in his 30s. Right. So, um... So then, Matthew chapter 3, verse 9... says these. Do not assume that you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able from these stones to raise up children um, for Abraham. And so the question becomes, you know, well, that sounds like, you know, how am I trying to say this? How could Jesus have pot and possibly raise up sons of Abraham? And that's no doubt what some of the Israelites were probably thinking. But don't forget this, that we are not sons of Abraham. We have been made sons of Abraham. So that's not really a contradiction. It's just a matter of perspective. And it's also, remember, that not everything that Jesus said had, had, had to be hyper-literal. It could be metaphorical, for instance. So Matthew 3, 7 says... But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming for baptism, he said to them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So if you notice there, he just said, When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees. But if you look at Luke chapter 3, verse 7, it seems like there's a contradiction. So he was saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized with him, you offspring of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Does not mention anything about Pharisees or Sadducees. And it also, um, let's see, and it also sounds like he's talking to different people. In Matthew, it sounds like he's talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees, but here in Luke, it says that he was talking to the crowd. Well, it's not as complicated as, as it could be. First off, he could have said the same thing multiple times to, to multiple groups. That's a possibility. Um, however, um, it could also be this, that he saw the Pharisees and Sadducees. He saw them, but then he said to the whole crowd, you, you, you brood of vipers. See, that, that's totally a possibility. Just because Luke doesn't say that he saw the Sadducees and Pharisees first doesn't mean that the Sadducees and Pharisees didn't prompt what John was about to say. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 says, As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Now you hop over to Mark, and it says in Mark 1, 7, and he was preaching, saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to bend down and untie the straps of his sandals. So there's two things I want to mention here. The first thing is that there's a difference in, in between the Gospels, and I'll see right here, verse 8. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. No fire. Is this a misquote? Remember, he didn't say that he recorded every single thing that every single person said. So, did he say the Holy Spirit or the Holy Spirit and fire? Well, likely what he said originally was the Holy Spirit and with fire. But Mark dropped the and with fire just to shorten the phrase. This doesn't mean that it was, it's inaccurate. It just means that he shortened the phrase. It actually happens all throughout the Gospels. So, if you're not okay with this now, you're not going to be okay with it with the many other times it happens in the Gospels. Making a phrase shorter is not, is not you know some way of lying about what happened. Like, let's say um, Gracie's talking and she says, um, I made some baked potatoes and uh, fried some apples. And But then I tell, I tell Eli, I say, hey, Gracie said that she made some baked, uh, some, uh, that she, uh, what did I say, fried some apples. Or whatever. Yeah. Well, that's not what she said. Well, it's not everything that, it's, that she said, but it is what she said. See what I mean? The, shortening a phrase doesn't make it not true. Matthew, Matthew and I think it's Luke both say the Holy Spirit and with fire, and then Mark just says with the Holy Spirit. The, the idea is the same. There's no reason to make a big deal out of, out of things like that because it doesn't claim that every single one has to say the exact same thing in the exact same way. So, um, <clears throat> Matthew 3.11 says, um, okay, 
this is a, a wor a, the way he words this. As for me, I have deputies of... Okay. But he who is coming after me is mightier than I am. Listen to this. I am not fit to remove his sandals. Okay. Now, in Mark, let's look at this. Mark 1, 7 says... Or, is this... Yeah. One who is coming who is mightier than I am, and I am not fit to bend down and untie the straps of his sandals. So one says untie, bend down and untie the straps. The other one says... Um, remove his sandals. I'm not fit to remove his sandals. So there's a few things. First off, taking off the straps could be could have the implication of taking off the shoe. Why would you take off the strap unless you were taking off the shoe? So it carries the same basic idea. There's that possibility, first off. And you might say, the, you're kind of tripping over little things, aren't you? That's a lot of what con finding contradictions in the Gospels are. People think that they found this one thing that breaks the back of the Gospels after 2,000 years of it being totally fine. And it's like, no, no, no. Honestly, he, he probably could have said both things, honestly. It's just at different times. You know, like, you know how my dad, when he's preaching, he uses a lot of the same phrases, right? Yeah. Like, he uses the same phrases and stories over and over again. It, does, he tell, does he tell it the same way every single time? A lot of times he does, but there'll, sometimes there'll be parts and, and words and stuff that are slightly different. Maybe he'll adapt it to, this, to the point that he's trying to make in that sermon. Same kind of idea. We don't know that John the Baptist didn't do that kind of thing. So, um, no serious impact on the meaning here. It, they, they both carry the same idea as to what's happening. The, he, he's not worthy to be even taking off the shoes of Jesus. So, um, that's it for today. I, I know that uh, we didn't make it real far. But, I mean, hey, we are in Matthew chapter 3. We're in Luke chapter, like, 2 or 3 or something. And we're in Mark chapter... I guess one. So <laughs> we are making progress.